you uh, uh, past week you, were, uh, you posted a couple articles. Uh, I think one from 2013 and one from this uh, just recently this year uh, regarding Bilderberg. Um, now Bilderberg, I guess, was started in what 1954, mm -hmm. and it was founded in the Netherlands. It's named after the hotel where they had their first meeting. Right. And it kind of, um, I guess, Howard kind of describes itself as kind of a, um, it's a, it's a kind of a secretive meeting uh, of... Um, kind of a secretive uh, discussion panel think tank yeah. that, uh, you know, didn't exist for a long time, supposedly, but now it's just obvious. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> what? What is big, no big deal? Now, here you have a meeting of roughly about 130 of the, of the West political, financial, military, uh, academic, media elites meeting to discuss you know, discuss policy in the future of the world. Uh, what's the problem with that? Well, <clears throat> I guess it really just depends on how far back you want to go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we were going to talk uh, libertarianism later on in the show, so I've got a whole bunch of notes here written out, you know, going, okay. going back in terms of philosophy. But uh, for Bilderberg itself, I think you have to look to Plans, as uh, I've mentioned in the past, um, of the Royal Society groups like that, that we read about in Tragedy and Hope, where <clears throat> the Royal Society tried out these different methods and these different plans for uh, creating continental trading blocks. So the idea, again, of free trade is very central to the global plan from the Atlantis' perspective, because what you need to do is <clears throat> remove any kind of barriers to internationalism right and ironically this idea goes back to marx right so this is kind of an internationalist marxist idea in terms of who the the first um, what we might call modern internationalists are i mean granted yes we can find origin in the uh, british east india company and the, the dutch trading company and so forth these were certainly internationalist uh command and control structures of economics that, uh, you know, required approval from the different crowns that were involved for you to have your business. Uh, but it's also true from the uh, left, quote unquote, left perspective of uh, socialism and communism that internationalism is a, is a potent driving force as, as well in that ideology back to Weishaupt, and uh, even earlier, we can find precedents in people like Joachim of Fior, uh, Thomas Munzer, and the Munzer Rebellion. Uh, so we can find kind of these bizarre sects of heretical views of the late Middle Ages and Middle Ages um, that would come to the <clears throat> flourish uh, at the time of the French Revolution as some of the revolutionaries adopted these older medieval Western what would be considered heretical from the vantage point of Catholic theology, these aberrant movements of uh, different ideologues and demagogues from that period. <clears throat> and so some of these uh, ideological trends find uh, their home in thinkers uh, like Marx and Weishaupt and Antonio Gramsci, sort of the, the well-known uh, luminaries of Illuminism. So when we consider the fact that <clears throat> both the capitalist scheme and the left-wing communist scheme have the international impetus behind them both, we can begin to see how there might be a merger or a common power structure behind both. Now, when I say this, I have to be clear that there's not exactly one capitalism, just like there's not necessarily one kind of communism or socialism. There's all different flavors. But again, what they both share in common is the idea of uh, an inherent principle of internationalism built within, to, in, within the system itself, right? So um, <clears throat> under the guise of, uh, you know, individual rights or rights theory that comes out of the uh, Enlightenment period, this philosophical assumption um, brings with it the idea of um, that uh, capital, right, is essentially something that kind of comes to one through divine providence. And so um, if we read Puritan thinkers or people like Benjamin Franklin, these, these kinds of quotes are, are profuse. The idea that the attainment of capital is, is itself uh, a sign of divine blessing. <clears throat> now, as the West discarded the 
theology that undergirded much of its ide uh, ideological underpinnings from the time of the Reformation, when we get up to the scientific revolution and then into um, the Darwinian thinkers and uh, the, the various German uh, reductionist thinkers, uh, the psychologists, uh, what happens is the, the, the theology that underpinned a lot of this is cast away and what kind of comes to take its place is the idea of social Darwinism. And so in social Darwinian theory, whoever right, uh, scrapes and bites and kicks their way to the top of the uh, human sphere through whatever means, because there are, aren't really any ethical uh, principles or means behind this, uh, well, then that you're just the apex predator, right? So if you've gotten to the top, it doesn't really matter through what it means, banking, war, cartels, uh, international drug running, as has been the case with many of the Western elite dynasties. Uh, it doesn't really matter because, again, we live in a now socially Darwinistic world where um, that's essentially survival of the fittest uh, collapsed into the economic sphere. So what I think happens is that while there are, as we said in our last uh, interview, real world, real time battles between people of diverging ideologies, between communists fighting capitalists and uh, the CIA fighting with Soviets. What happens is that when power reaches a power block level, right, when you have something like Apple that's international, or you have a trading block union of, of uh, governmental entities that uh, are moving towards becoming international, much like we, in the same way that we discussed Michael Corleone's rise to power, right, when he, Michael goes from local to national to international. At that point, it really doesn't matter what the ideologies are anymore, right? So ideologies are kind of, they kind of lose their luster when it becomes a situation of realpolitik, right? Just the will to power. Uh, so whatever gets the job done, right, comes to dominate. So it's not, it's not really anymore a matter of um, being fair. I mean, fairness doesn't really translate into geopolitics. So <clears throat> I would say that uh, to understand Bilderberg, we have to understand that it is the same entity, uh, one of its manifestations, one of its arms, octopus legs, whatever, uh, of the same power structure of the Atlanticists, which uh, has an ideology of uh, complete excuse me, technocratic control, <clears throat> uh, and that this must be implemented globally. Um, they have been secret for many, many decades. Uh, now that they've gotten media exposure, they're, I think, a, a little less concerned with uh, anyone knowing about it, and I don't think they really think anybody's going to be able to do anything about it. Um, it's probably... What I suspect happens is that over time, as these kinds of groups uh, gain exposure, these meetings, as they gain exposure, they probably become less uh, instrumental in, in actually shaping policy. So there's probably other meetings that go on that, that we don't know about uh, that are sort of the new Bilderberg. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Bilderberg is, uh, you know, it does contain a lot of powerful big names uh, in the, the political and economic spheres. So <clears throat> I think it's still important to look at Bilderberg. It's still important for researchers to understand what it is, what it represents, what it, the ideology that it comes out of. <clears throat> As I said before, it's not an ideology of necessarily a strict uh, capitalism per se, because when we read, for example, the works of David Rockefeller <clears throat> in his memoirs, he discusses his affinity many times for Chinese-style communism, right? So uh, why, why would that be, right? Well, I think for most of us who have spent some time researching in alternative media, we know why that is, we, because bankers like socialism and communism. They're the ones who were behind Marxism's spread to begin with. And uh, as, as many researchers have pointed out, the reason for that is that, uh, as Carol Quigley points out, it's the best way <clears throat> in certain situations to <clears throat> consolidate wealth. So a lot of times we get caught up in consolidate and transfer wealth, excuse me. A lot of times we get caught up in the idea that, well, <clears throat> economic regulations, that's a thing of the left. <clears throat> excuse me. 
And the left wants all these economic regulations because they want to shut down business. And business is where we get innovation and people make their living and so forth. And that's, so that's the left's attack on, on uh, progress, on real progress through uh, innovation. Uh, and then, of course, there's the other perspective that, uh, that the left might have that, well, international business is just this uh, viper and they go out there and, you know, they rip everybody off and the, the CEOs are the 1% making all this money and the wet workers make, you know, $10 an hour, $5 an hour, whatever it is. So we need less regulation because, you know, uh, or excuse me, we need, we need more regulations on the corporations, right? Well, the reality is we live in a corporate state where corporations own governments. <laughs> uh, corporations are much larger than governments, right? So in other words, you can basically just consider governments uh, as subsidiaries of corporate interests. And that's who pays for their campaigns. That's who lobbies to get them to vote a certain way. And that's who can easily destroy them if they get out of line, this or that senator or politician. So <clears throat> that's the real world that we live in. That's not the uh, fantasy world of these different ideologies that seek to impose you know, this, an ideal upon the real. Uh, and it's important to understand that people at the Bilderberg, say, level, for example, for them, <clears throat> You might at some point want to use regulation in one area to further your designs. And you might want to use deregulation in another area to further your design. So from that perspective of power politics, that's kind of relative. It's irrelevant and relative to what needs to be done, right? So as we've discussed in the past, you know, John Perkins, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and as well in his book Hoodwinked, um, he comes at it from the corporate perspective of saying, here's what I did going in IMF shock doctrine type stuff. We, you know, tell these countries uh, they've got to sign out all this debt and then uh, they put their resources up as collateral. Uh, and so, you know, in, in that case, uh, deregulation and regulation could be alternately useful depending on what you need. You know, if you, if you own the government, for example, in a certain country, <clears throat> then they're basically a subsidiary of your corporation, right? So your corporation might want to pass certain legislation to put other businesses out of business, right? And so in that case, you would have monopoly of that market, whatever it might be, right? So um, a good example of this is the one that I mentioned uh, in, I think, our last interview or in a recent interview uh, with the International Crisis Group, which was itself a, a functionary of the, the Bilderberg Group. Uh, certain Bilderberg group members met and formed the International Crisis Committee or Crisis Group. <clears throat> this is uh, characters like General Wesley Clark and uh, this is Bigner Brzezinski. And they drew up a plan for uh, Milosevic and Serbia, right, and, and, and taking over that situation, right? So in that case, it's not really ultimately about whether Milosevic was a good guy or a bad guy. It's simply a matter of a certain power block wanting to uh, capitalize on the resources of that area. So that's really what's going on. That's why Bilderberg matters. Most people don't talk about the International Crisis Group as an example of something that Bilderberg was involved in or Doctors with Borders. The head of Doctors with Borders is a member of Bilderberg. Uh, and these are just really covers, shells for faces on the same hydra, basically. They're, they're arms on, on, a, on a similar octopus. And sometimes those those arms might uh, get a little mad at each other. They might have a little bit of competition amongst them. But ultimately, they're all unified uh, in the same goal, which is, as, as I said, is ultimately the dream of every internationalist, whether you're of the Marxist stripe, uh, first international, second international, or whether you're of the capitalist David Rockefeller technocrat stripe, uh, the dream is the same. And the dream is global standardization and global government, world federation, and uh, depopulation. And that's really, really the whole kit and caboodle. And, uh, so it's like uh, you said that the Gabinos versus the Bananos. Yeah, you might have that. Uh, yeah. And then, and like, like in, the, uh, in the, in the Godfather, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's that meeting where they all go and, and Marlon Brando's down, and he says, hey, uh, 
Uh, who, who's pushing the drugs, huh? Who's pushing the drugs? Well, he's mad because somebody's pushing the drugs, and then the other Gambinos, and the, the, they're there, and uh, you know, we want to push the drugs. You're you're living in the past. The drugs are the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, you, you mentioned, could you, uh, it's interesting you mentioned the, the uh, ideologies that don't mean much, really. They're just the props. Uh, I think it was Mark Hackard appeared recently on Red Ice. And yeah, it was a great interview, about, yeah. Yeah, whereas for excellent call, cool. I think I yeah I linked it from found it from your site. Um, but he he referred to basically fascism, communism, uh, whether isms is just ideological playthings. I think is the term he used. Yeah, I, I have, have used the example, or I've I've said that it's basically power structures traffic in ideologies. So yeah. we we could view them as um, maybe like software programs or. Um, you know, uh, just ways of giving people a different kind of model uh, that will function to corral them into a certain uh, controlled version of things. So it's kind of like a, or, or it's kind of like role playing, right? I mean, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, idealism is something that I think most of us have in our teens and twenties. I mean, we think that we know everything and that we're able to change the world, <laughs> and then we're so smart and uh, you know, yeah, read a few books and yeah, get it all figured out. Exactly. Yeah. The, 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 <laughs> Adults are so stupid and we're so smart. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the reality is that the people who are running things and have been engaged in this long-term plan, you know, 100, 200 years at least, they they know human nature uh, and they know how human nature is susceptible to so many weaknesses, uh, flattery, uh, utopianism, uh, appealing to baser desires and instincts, uh, psychological warfare, manipulation, etc. All of these techniques are old and are very well known. Uh, so, you know, to, to think that there's some ideological golden ticket or, or skeleton key that will somehow sort of open all the doors is, is pretty naive. And I, I don't think that you know, a lot of people who probably listen to your podcast or, and hopefully not a lot of my readers would fall into those traps, but I think that they still do ensnare quite a lot of people and, and they're worth discussing. They're worth talking about because again, you're dealing with people who are masters of manipulation. You know, I mean, you don't get to the level of, of Bilderberg without being, I think, you know, master manipulator, um, and, and having a master sense of, how the corporate world and the corporate structure works and, and how it's basically a big con game, right? I mean, that's essentially what you're dealing with, like the best con men out there. <laughs> yeah. And so you don't think, uh, looking at electoral politics, you don't think billion, billion dollar presidential campaigns are crowdfunded? I'm sorry, did you say that again? What now? You don't think billion dollar presidential campaigns are crowdfunded? <laughs> <laughs> uh Billion dollar presidential campaigns for a four hundred thousand dollar year job. Maybe if uh, right, maybe if uh, George Soros is like clicking on his mouse like a hundred times in a row, and, <laughs> <laughs> like, he's he's donating a hundred bucks, like just refreshing the page and I don't know. Uh, but you mentioned the uh, uh, the the idea that you know various factions, and it's almost like you have the uh, the Soros uh, wing, and then you have the 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 the, the, the Koch brother, uh, the Koch brother ring mm -hmm. wing. Uh, and they might they might pose as free marketers or more libertarian, but they're, they're oligarchs. They're looking for some sort of regulation that suits them, some sort of government legislation, whether it's you know opening up uh, uh, oil in Alaska. Yeah, or, yeah right. Uh, Soros may favor something else, and and they both uh, fund their respective little uh, groups and organizations. Exactly. To, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and also I think there are other players that can come into this too with Russia. I mean, you can have, I think, uh, you know, Putin probably wanting to consolidate power and, and getting certain oligarchs to leave. Uh, and I think that the nature of, of the globalist plan from the West is such that it's with it, built within its system. It consumes and eats all other systems as well as, as, well as itself. So I think that it is possible to have um, actors in global geopolitical theater that do have their own interests. Um, you know, of course, we always have to be aware and leery of the possibility that these uh, may be, there may be a, a degree of uh, stagecraft involved in these two, uh, especially, say, with China, where uh, 
the you know the whole history as we discussed i think in the past the whole history of the rise of mao is intimately connected with the oss training and aiding and bill donovan setting up the spy network throughout china <clears throat> And uh, Mao being a yali and all that, which we we discussed, so that we won't go over that. But uh, if we look at BRICS, you know, I, I was reading the other night, and I was talking with James Corbett. And we we brought up the 2001 uh, document from Goldman Sachs archives by Jim O'Neill, their head guy at that time, talking about BRICS and the importance of the rise of BRICS. <laughs> so I see I see bantered and chattered all over chattered about all around the internet uh, in the last year or two the, the importance of BRICS and how BRICS is going to be this opposition to the globalists and all this stuff and uh you know with these countries that really don't have a whole lot in common other than uh, you know wherever BRICS is designed to go things which it looks like it's also going to be part of this special drawing right IMF type basket thing uh that to me more so suggests the idea of just kind of a divergence amongst opinions um, between kind of the Straussian neoconservative approach of American, generic American imperialism, because as we know from Strauss and so forth, the idea of, of America is really just an ideology. It's not, it's not a real, it's also a tool, um, as opposed to maybe what we might call the more left wing of it with uh, the Brzezinski technocrat idea so you know, you've got maybe oil guys that maybe don't so much like the brzezinski types you know like the bush family and the but ultimately again the goal the goals are really are, are unified and it's it's all about standardization uh so you know the idea that BRICS is somehow some uh, fight against the new world order i think is is pretty naive as well that's very similar to the um at least in the united states in the 60s i think we're culminated in the Kennedy assassination what some have called the Yankee Cowboy War. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I have I have heard some of this. Uh, people speak of the Dixie Mafia uh, and we know that uh, JFK was uh, you know involved with uh, the more Catholic circles and, and things like this. So you know you've got wasp circles of uh, mm -hmm. you know things like that with uh, skull and bones and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of this, you know, just gets really, really hairy and hard to figure out. But uh, I, I have no doubt that uh, Kennedy, you know, had done enough and said enough that uh, sounded dangerous to um, what would eventually become the neoconservative power structure that still dominates that, uh, you know, I don't think there's much question as to the fact that that's what took him out. Yeah, that was part of that faction. The uh, yeah. when he started talking about a a uh, detente with the, with the Soviets, and he gave that speech in June of '63 at, at uh, American University. Yep. he kind of signed his death warrant with that. Yeah, and, I've but, argued that for a while. And yeah. there's a book that I would recommend with a lot of caveats uh, that touches on a lot of this. Maybe not so much JFK, but more of the uh, global aspects of things that I've been talking about. And it and it touches on the uh, Roman Catholic angle of it. Um, again, I have a list of caveats that I would say with this author, but uh, Keys of This Blood, which I think came out in 1991 by Malachi Martin, is oh yeah, yeah, it's about 800 pages, but it's worth reading because Martin discusses from somewhat of an insider perspective all of this merging of you know what we might call third way between capitalism and socialism and the move into the global economic sphere. Now I. I I'm of the opinion that Martin uh, was involved in this and was actually covertly sort of a supporter of all this. Right, so he uh, sort of played the role of a quote traditional Catholic. Uh, while, I've heard that. While yeah. at the same yeah. time, uh, was actually involved in helping to draft some of the documents of Vatican II that he claimed were heretical. So there's a little bit of double minded du duplicity going on with Martin, and he also made a lot of sort of unsubstantiated bizarre statements at times in the past too but nevertheless there is a lot of valuable information in that book and it, it was relatively prophetic for 1991 so a lot of people talk about we think about reading big geopolitical tomes like tragedy and hope or uh, you know the works of brzezinski or something like that 
Uh, but that's one that's overlooked because you've got a billion people that are influenced by Catholicism and mm -hmm. uh, Keys of This Blood is very, very insightful. The, um, that's something that's always fascinating to me. The, the, uh, the Kennedys and what they represented was, was often derisively called the, the, the Irish Mafia. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there are many factors, I think, when it went into his murder. Um, right. Uh, there was kind of a, a, a kind of a coalition or of interest involved: organized crime, uh, mm -hmm. military-industrial complex, um, CIA, CIA. Right, right. But the Wasp Catholic angle was very interesting to me because, although Kennedy had his faults, um, he was very, very much culturally a Catholic, and I think that that might have uh, factored into his uh, alleged transformation that he yes. went on after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, I think what it was is he wasn't at, at heart a psychopath. <laughs> probably, and, probably, yeah. You know. And so he was, what's going on here? He's surrounded by all these madmen. And uh, they realized that they had to be taken out because uh, he wasn't playing by the rules anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not one who, you know, who idolizes Camelot and that sort of stuff. The yeah. many faults and Kennedy, and right. JFK and his brother RFK could be very ruthless in their politics. Um, Absolutely, yeah. But. Even RFK was very much culturally Catholic, as I said that RFK would have been the priest in the family in an earlier age. And same with RFK. I think uh, I think what happened with RFK was because obviously RFK was was getting very close to the presidency, and that couldn't be tolerated because he would have opened up the investigation again uh, into his brother's murder. Mm. Uh, but uh, that's a whole other area of speculation. But it, it is that is interesting part of the what the, what the Kennedys represented was sort of this independent Catholic power center that was outside the wasp elite and he had also ticked off a lot of the cowboys the the Dick, people that had dixie mafia dixie mafia and of course bird guy who owned the texas book mm -hmm. depository he was part of that and uh so that, that's a whole nother discussion yeah i but think back, I, I, go sorry. ahead no i'm sorry you go ahead um but back to uh to uh bilderberg and come these power centers um can you give us an example of some of their influence so, uh you know the, the, yeah they, they make policy. Is there, are there examples of them making policy? Maybe. Yeah, I had, a I had a debate with a guy who was challenging me on this this last week, and he said, well, it, what you're talking about with this uh, 1955 document is not really uh, any kind of argument because the uh, Europe, a European Union had been discussed back in the 20s. And I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking... Well, well, yeah, and this comes out of World War One, and then the 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 first guy to want to try to interpose this was Hitler. So absolutely, there's an older idea for a, an American or a, excuse me, a European Union, which I've mentioned many times. But it is important to point out again that Bilderberg was secret. So Bilderberg in 1955 drew up a document that I highlighted in my piece that discusses the creation of a European common market, which didn't actually come into play until 1958. And then supposedly the public release of the European Union is 1993. But here we have a 1955 document that discusses the plan for European unity. So that's just one crucial example, I think, of the scope and power of what we're dealing with as, as kind of a, a version of a policy implementing think tank on a global scale that has a tangible you know factual representation for something that they've accomplished uh, openly I, mean, I don't know I don't know how hard it is to figure this out but uh, you know when we look at UN Bretton Woods IMF World Bank it all comes out of this same the same planning and the same structure and uh, if somebody would say, well, how are you linking this to anything to do with, say, capitalism or something like that? Well, good question. In Dave Rockefeller's biography, Memoirs, and on page 83, he discusses studying under Friedrich von Hayek. Hayek was his tutor. And after praising and criticizing Hayek, mainly criticizing him for being boring, not not for his economics, but he says, nevertheless, I found myself largely in agreement with his basic economic philosophy. Now, interesting too, I haven't read it, but in his memoirs, he mentions that the thesis he wrote, Rockefeller that is, uh, under his tutors, had to do with Anselm and his theory of debt 
an atonement in terms of economics and how Anselmian theology, the idea of uh, the only way for man to be rescued from his infinite offense against God would be for God himself to become man and to pay that infinite debt due to his being divine. Rockefeller apparently wanted to apply this to the economic sphere in the history of the West, and uh, I, I would I would love to read that that <laughs> that, that thesis sometime because it just sounds wild. But uh, if we think about the free market scheme, that uh, that idea, and we look at von Hayek himself in Road to Serfdom, in the la towards the end of it, I think it's the appendix at the back. Uh, there's a whole discussion of world government, and von Hayek says, well, we're going to have a world government. It's, it's called the Prospects of International Order. He says, we're going to have it, but we got to figure out what kind we want. And he says, I want a libertarian world government. He says, but but it's, it needs to have a global police army. <laughs> Contradiction. Right. I mean, and, and I've my notes in this piece are, are just full of, uh, I circle a C. <laughs> whenever I see a contradiction. Yeah, okay, okay. So I've got a lot of circled C's here, CCC, <laughs> uh, because it sort of goes against the very things that I think make up the presuppositions of classic laissez-faire neoclassical economics. Well, I grant, uh, you know, I'm sure that there are libertarians that are fuming right now who will be listening to this. They'll say, well, that's, you know, so what? That was his, his idea. That was, you know... <clears throat> Who cares if he thought that? We don't have to accept everything somebody says. That's, uh, that's our libertarian idea. Well, I would say if we go back to philosophy, <clears throat> go back to the, the, the history of the West, what happens is, um, and I'm not trying to exalt Platonism, but <clears throat> there's an idea in Platonism that I think is useful that points a better way out of this dialectical dilemma and it's called metexas and it's the idea of participation and in this philosophical position you can have a thing be a thing and participate in other things without it losing its identity right so you can have multiple forms can be instantiated in a single particular without that particular thing losing its particularity right so there's a there's an attempt at least in this philosophical idea to balance the one and the many and that's ultimately what this economic and social political issue is going to hinge on is the question of the one and the many so when we look at the history of philosophy a lot of philosophers have said it's it's kind of a commentary on the one and the many right so all these different philosophers have different ideas so hegel thinks that the one and the many is balanced through the synthesis, ultimately that's uh, sort of working its way out, process theology and history. Um, you know, other thinkers would say that uh, it's the collective that we have to look to, one big amorphous glump, glob of everyone together is the solution to everything. Sort of the UN New Agey kind of idea of Huxley and his perennial philosophy, other philosophers might say, oh, no, it's all the, you know, the individual, the individual's rights of, uh, hedonism or rational speculation and pleasure, whatever. The, there seems to be this dialectical pendulum swing. And <clears throat> what uh, this philosophical notion from Platonism says is that for a thing to be a thing, it doesn't have to uh, only be defined by the characteristics that are apparent to it or that we perceive it to have in terms of empiricism. So if a thing, say, is me, uh, my skin is uh, white or, you know, pinkish, whatever you want to call it, kind of sort of badly tanned, half tanned. Uh, I'm, I'm partly brown, right? Uh, I have blue eyes, right? And uh, I have a soul and so forth, right? So none of these particular characteristics of me are... Uh, just applicable to me right their brownness is something that sort of occurs in other instances in nature right it's it's it goes beyond just one instantiation 
Uh, but I'm also unique in that I, I possess brownness in this specific right case. I, this is my brownness. This is my blue eyes, right? Uh, and what happens is when Aristotle sort of becomes preeminent in philosophy, ultimately in the West, the time of uh, the Middle Ages, Aristotle says, no, 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 we got to get rid of that. Uh, we need a different philosophical, metaphysical conception of what it is for a thing to be a thing. And he proposes the idea of what's called hylomorphism. <clears throat> now, this all may sound a little obscure and highfalutin and all that, but it actually is relevant because it's actually going to play into economics and social order. So that's the argument I'm going to make here. So when Aristotle comes along and says, now we need hylomorphism, what that is, is he says, all right, we got we have a, a things out there in the world, and they do have essences. So you're right about that, Plato. But their essences are not uh, participating in all these different essences out there, redness, all that so forth. Uh, the 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 essence of a thing is really just its matter and its form, right? So basically, he's collapsing form or anything transcendent, if you will, into the thing itself, right? And when you do that, <clears throat> because of the notion that uh, Aristotle has of simplicity, what that must mean in terms of prima materia, or that an object is made up of prime matter, the material cause, he calls it, uh, it can only have one form, right? So you can only be you, and if we're speaking in terms of humans here, it has to be a body and a soul, right? That's the that's the uh, that's the being or the essence of a body or of a person. Excuse me, is is the composite of body and soul. Uh, and so, what he says is that <clears throat> a substantial form is what we're calling this is a simple unified uh, atomic unit is a good way to think of it. So there's not another you out there, uh, and the you that's you is not participating in anything else because the brownness or the, the whiteness or whatever, if you've got white hair, if you've got blue eyes, that those characteristics, Aristotle says, those are just secondary. Right? They're just accidental, he says. Not accident in the sense of like happenstance or a wreck, but accidental in the sense of not being essential to you. So if all those characteristics are accidental or secondary, as they would be called in the Enlightenment, then uh, things are only what they are, is basically what we get from this, right? And ultimately, this means that the blueness, redness, whiteness, these, all these sensuous properties of a thing are uh, really just, um, they're able to be discarded, basically. They're, they're not necessary. The medieval theologians would use this whole scheme to try to figure out how in the mass, the uh, bread and wine are transubstantiated into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, right? So this is where this starts to become useful in terms of social theory in uh, medieval Catholic theology. Now, that's uh, substance versus form. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so the, in, in the mass, when the priest uh, prays over the bread and wine, uh, it retains the accidents of bread and wine, but the substance is become body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Right? So this is the medieval doctrine of transubstantiation for Roman Catholic theology. Now, <clears throat> so we've already, we've discarded older uh, Platonic ideas of metexis, right, where multiple things can participate in multiple essences without losing their identity as unique or in or uh, particular. So now what we've done is collapse anything transcendent into the here and the now. Uh, and that means that the characteristics that a thing has basically are just made up of the sum of its parts, right? So what is a thing? Well, it's prime matter plus uh, color, solidity, uh, shape, form, etc. That's all a thing is. The thing is that thing. <laughs> so so that, that book over there has no connection to other books other than that it's a book. Uh, and what happens in, in Western philosophy is that this becomes eventually empiricism and nominalism. Actually, nominalism is prior to, to empiricism. But what this means is that the things that we talk about in the world, when we're, we're ascribing these, these properties and characteristics to a thing, they're just names. 
completely human token inventions. Social constructs. Uh, the objects in the world don't actually possess these things. They're just names given to sensuous qualities that we perceive about objects in the world. All right. Now, <clears throat> it's not by accident that by this time in the West, economic theory and political theory have transitioned out of older medieval notions of, say, the chain of being idea where you have hierarchy, everything in its place, you're born in a certain class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now everything is supposedly under, quote, revolution, right? Protestant revolution, reformation, scientific revolution, reformation, uh, humanism, renaissance, which birthed humanism, uh, so forth and so on. All of these revolutions come about. And what these revolutions are is a revolution based on some of the philosophical principles and ideas that I'm outlining, much of which has to do with the transition away from metaphysics and um, objective uh, metaphysical principles and essences into empiricism. And that's what comes to dominate the uh, modern world in terms of its ideology as a whole. And empiricism gives rise to relativism, uh, and, and I would argue that in the market sphere, this is why we have the rise of uh, neoliberal uh, classical, uh, or excuse me, uh, neoliberal economics and um, social Darwinian based survival of the fittest, uh, you know, crony capitalism. It's really just sort of the ultimate apex flowering of, of all these, these philosophical ideas. And that's why I think philosophy is so important. So that may, I, that may have been a little convoluted or a little difficult. No, to, I see what you're getting but, at. I, but I hope you get what yeah. I'm getting at. Because what happens yeah. is when, when a thing is just uh, a collection of its parts and doesn't have any transcendent reference or any reference to anything eternal beyond the here and the now, what happens is you begin to see everything that way. So in the market, the objects and humans are basically transmutable units of exchange and consumption, right? And this produces standardization and monoculture, right? So this is where we get Henry Ford going in and studying the scientific efficiency of how, you know, quick you can make this part and how many people need to be in this uh, row of, you know, in the factory and how much time they have to work before they get too tired to keep working. So this, this obsession with uh, quantification and efficiency and, Taylorism. Excuse me. Taylorism. Yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. And so, what do we get? What we get from this is then this. You can see why we would get globalization from this. Yeah. This becomes uh, the same pop music in Korea, the same fast food everywhere. McDonald's French fries everywhere. Everywhere, right? right. Uh, so the collapse. To sum up, then the collapsing of the transcendent into the now in terms of uh, social order. Uh, basically means the removal by necessity within that system. It, it's it's inherent within that system to remove any notion or conception of ethnoi in the Greek, which is peoples or people groups. And it results in the loss of, um, I would say, ultimately tradition, history, culture, uh, and meaning on a local level, which ironically, that was the very thing that it was intended to protect, the, right, the local guy's ability to engage the market and to make a profit and so forth right so and i don't mean to be overly simplistic here i don't it's not like i have all the answers or i think that uh, you know uh, it's not it's not co it's not capitalism or socialism or communism it's none of those things are are perfect answers because there aren't perfect answers we live in a difficult world that doesn't work on um idealisms so um, I, I personally yeah i do ex i i do support local capitalism i think uh, local businesses should have the right to uh, do what they do and to manufacture their products uh, and to you know, make a profit. There's nothing wrong with those things. Uh, but, go ahead. Um, this is an important point because um, I guess a market purist, or someone who defends the genuine free market, would say, um, might say, yes, this is true, but you can't look at the current situation and say that the st stifling of local businesses mm -hmm. by these large corporations is a market phenomenon because uh, people like outfits like Bain Capital, which create staples, mm -hmm. um, are have a, um, uh, a front, have a, are, get access to cheap capital via the Fed, and also some would say that Bain Capital was has been used as a conduit for laundered drug money, sure, to finance staples. Uh, same thing with Walmart. 
I heard an interesting comment about Walmart regarding discussion about Jade Helm. You know, the rumors regarding Jade Helm and Walmarts and all that stuff. <laughs> and that aside, the, the skeptical interviewer said, the guy, well, I never thought Walmart was a free market operation anyway. You don't get that type of growth with such low margin a retail operation. And within that growth has been rampant stock fraud uh, and uh, laundering for, for, for drug money. Um, you know, you know, these chain outfits, you just, that's one way to launder all the cash. Mm -hmm. And so I know what you're saying is what happens is this isn't a free market really operating. Anymore. Oh, I understand that now, yeah. presently, yeah. we are not in a, quote, free market. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And, uh, but there I, are advantages to, like, um, economies of scale. But we, yes. we're not, that's not what we're getting. Some would say, I mean, I read an article, the market would only tolerate a business of a certain size before it becomes inefficient and collapses. But you don't get big business until you get the idea of corporate personhood. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, right? So that's in itself is an intrusion on the market. Which is a uh, manifestation of what I was arguing philosophically yeah, is that exactly. you can just so you can just like name that. a thing a thing and it becomes that thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though and it's so, not. And so the destruction of, of say the, the local regional businesses and it's sort of it's 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 um, absorption into global corp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> or you know is a, is a function of the very corrupt processes that we witnessed at Bilderberg. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's, I think, your point made this to his artists. This, 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 they're not, you know, John D. Rockefeller said himself, uh, he said, uh, competition is a sin. Yep. Competition with him. And what Rockefeller is represents is the whole ideology, which I think you're getting at with that explanation. Yes. Very useful explanation, by the way. This uh, idea, uh, this I guess, a form of reductionism that occurs when yes. you start to get away from this. Yeah. Is and it, does it play in the pragmatism at all? American pragmatism? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I was, I, I know, the American thinking. experiment is really yeah. an experiment in, if we look at somebody like ba uh, Bacon, Francis Bacon, and the American experiment is is the scientistic experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the real mystery of his, you know, all that gobbledygook that people think about, the yeah, Atlantis and all that stuff. No, it's, it's an experiment in an enlightenment scientism. Mm -hmm. uh, and that ultimately does give rise to pragmatism because if basically all we know is sense reality which is what dominates our the global philosophy is uh, empiricism uh, and if that's all the only means that we have for knowing things then basically the phenomena of reality are phantasms because they come and go and they can be transmuted named changed renamed at will um, I mean, I think something like Caitlyn Jenner is a perfect example of this. I mean, if, if we have fiat, uh, as I said in another interview, if we have fiat currency globally, which is just creating and naming a thing money when it isn't, then why not have fiat gender? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we saw this with this NAACP fraud person who white says, well, I identify as black. I mean, this is a manifestation, I would argue, of this very ideology of, of bad philosophy playing out um, for our eyes, and it's ultimately a tool of the of the technocrats. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the market process. Um, you're making you make a great, a good point there that it it's not about saying you know business itself is bad or uh, the idea of competition is bad. Um, because that may sound like what I'm saying, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to give an analysis of where I think the West has gone in the last, you know, thousand, two thousand years. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the philosophical ideas play out in the market sphere as well. So does that mean I have all the answers? No. Um, but I do think there's a valid criticism in um, persons like uh, Rene Ganon and uh, Reign of Quantity. Um, that does not mean that I accept all of his uh, ideology or his Sufism. I just think he makes good criticisms that uh, are, are worth looking at, uh, as well as somebody like Oswald Spengler. I do not agree with Spengler's cultural relativism, but he does make good criticisms. Well, it's like Naomi Klein, who I don't really take yes, as a guilty exactly. thinker, right. but her idea of shock doctrine has validity. Absolutely. You know, uh, so there's, you have to you know, separate the wheat from the chaff and say, oh, they, she's got a point here. And apply it to something else. She, she's only getting, and maybe you know, I don't know what extent she's part of controlled opposition or not. But um, it's um, getting the get, uh, the builder good example of what you're talking about here, because I can pin uh, examples of some of the uh, power plays that have, that have come out of Bilderberg. Mm -hmm. uh, I read this in uh, F. William Engdahl's book, A Century of War, mm -hmm. regarding the oil 
uh, crisis of the 1970s. It came out of Bilderberg. And the according to Engdahl, according to the documents that Engdahl has, he has documents to back this up, is that in, 19, in the May of 73, uh, at, at the Bilderberg meeting, uh, the oil companies there said they needed a 400% increase in the price of oil to make some of their investments, some, some of their exploration deals market, uh, viable economically. And what happened was it was there that Kissinger met and devised a plan to uh, concoct a, a, a war, the uh -huh. Yom Kippur War, as we came to be known. And he used his shuttle diplomacy to create all types of miscommunications to start a war. And, you know, from that you had the uh, U.S. backed Israel. Uh, he got Nixon to do that. He was enmeshed in Watergate, so he wasn't in control anymore. Uh -huh. um, uh, but from that, you got the the uh, the oil embargo, which right. So it was it was an OPEC. It was actually Bilderberg above OPEC. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Bilderberg telling him, and OPEC was the fall guy. Right. And at the same time, um, at the same time, they constructed the petrodollar recycling system. Um, roughly the same time. Mm. So all those oil dollars, or all those, all those, the increase would fund, fund all the money back to New York, Chase Manhattan Bank, the Rockefeller. <laughs> <laughs> See how this works? Yeah. I mean, I, it's just every day I learn a new angle on how yeah. the scam works. I'm just amazed. And I mean, yeah. I always just come back to, you know, just like master con men. It's, I don't yeah. And it, it gets even worse. It gets even more ruthless because at 1974, you had um, Kessinger write the National Security Study Memorandum 200. Right, and I guess that you know, that that talks about the disturbing growth of the growth. economic growth and the population, population growth of, right. of the third world, and how to reverse that. You reverse that through debt, and the price shocks did that to the third world. Mm. Wow! And and it created all that and the market for debt in the third world, which ultimately through the IMF and World Bank are covered by the taxpayers. <laughs> mm. And that that created the IMF. Uh, yeah, yeah. You all system. we all become the collateral. Right. Yeah, with the, yeah, with, the, with our birth certificates. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, I, I heard that probably the first time I heard that particular idea. Your brain was, can send information to the excuse rest me, of your sorry, I was, I was trying to get an article here, but uh, those stupid ads that always play, they're so yeah. annoying. But uh, I heard that probably in two, 2005 or six, and I thought that was crazy. Uh, and sure enough, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it actually is true. And I wasn't trying to be, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but I'm saying that it's a lot, so much of the stuff that you hear initially, you think, no it's great, way, yeah. that's, that's, who could be that uh, clever and devious? <laughs> yeah. I was listening to a Daniel Estelon interview. Interestingly, the questions were in Russian and his answers were in English mm -hmm. um, on YouTube. And he, he refers to Bilderberg as an aristocracy of purpose. So traces his lineage it. back to the Venetian black nobility and even further. I'm talking about thousand-year-old families, like uh, it quadri quadrillionaires. He says, <laughs> and we don't know the names of the people who really run the show. If you know the names, they're just lieutenants. You know, I suspect that he's probably right to, yeah. to a degree about that because uh, when I read Shadow Masters, he, he brought up, and that that's full of little nuggets and details here and there that that are just amazing. I haven't seen mm -hmm. anybody else point out, but uh, he mentioned. And I'm going from memory here, so I'm not... It was something to do with the, the Prince of Monaco and how him and his wife were involved in, I don't know if it was diamonds or drugs, smuggling or something, and uh, they kind of got the big head, and then, <laughs> and then and somebody Grace. and somebody put one of them away, right? So That was Princess Grace's accident, right? Oh, is that that's probably what he's talking about. Okay, so yeah, yeah that's, that, that's that Prince of Monaco. Yeah, Grace yeah. Kelly, right? The accident. Um, wow, okay, you know, okay. <laughs> and he was also telling a story that in 1991, uh, both Clinton uh, and and uh, Dan Quayle went to Bilderberg. But the Clinton story is interesting is because at that time, Clinton was just this governor from a, a poor southern state. And it was that time that David Rockefeller met with him and told him if he supported NAFTA. And Clinton's response was, what's NAFTA? And he explained to him. And he said, is it important to you? And David Rockefeller said, it's very important to me. And he said, well... I'm glad you understand, Mr. President. <laughs> yeah, Will Banyan has an argument that uh, I haven't looked at it yet, but somebody just sent it to me. Uh, about Bilderberg, I thought it was yeah. Did, did, did Clinton go to Bilderberg? But I don't, I don't know if that's. I haven't looked at it yet. But uh, yeah. Anyway, what uh, what I was going to say is that there's an interesting 
well, it's insightful to consider um, the free trade itself, right? I mean, free trade is, is basically an older idea that Marx said would be necessary. Um, it's also, it was uh, part of the continental plan of, as I've said, of the Royal Society. Uh, and so when we look at something like NAFTA and we consider, you know, the TTIP, TTP and all that, it's just another version of the same thing, but more dr mm -hmm. draconian. So t to posit that, uh, you know, this group doesn't have any power or isn't, I mean, that's ludicrous. It's all these powerful people. How could it, I mean, the sum, <laughs> the sum of these parts, if we want to use the Aristotelianism again, is, is one corporate person, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, but, and, and uh, NFL draft gets more coverage from the press. Exactly, right. Of so. course, why, did, why doesn't the press cover them? Well, they're owned. <laughs> they I mean, they go there. <laughs> uh, the heads of them do. Catherine Graham, yeah, yeah, people they, like that, right? Washington Post. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you have that. Uh, I think that quote from David Rockefeller, from nineteen ninety one. Mm hmm. So about the to the Washington New World Post, Order. Times, yeah, yeah. Time Magazine, other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost forty years. Okay. <laughs> well, but they're not secret because they don't <laughs> exist. But now yeah. they do exist. But it doesn't matter because they're not a big it, deal. He went on to explain it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like <laughs> his quote in memoirs about about populism. Yeah. He says, I, you know, I'm I'm a globalist. Yes, I'm not a populist. <laughs> and so, I mean, there it is. And there's the admission. But, but I mean, NAFTA is really, and I understand Ron Paul's arguments that uh, NAFTA includes all these state taxes, and so therefore it wasn't real uh, free trade in a libertarian sense. It's called managed trade, I guess you could say. Right, but yeah. but I would respond by saying that, you know, I, I still think there's a, a valid uh, philosophical criticism from the perspective of uh, the fact that, again, the idea of... Um, basically collapsing all of reality into the here and now is, is really what gives gives rise to uh, market dominance and then a few centuries of what Spengler calls homo economicus, man obsessed with the economic sphere, uh, mm -hmm. then produces, I think, man obsessed with transcending this sphere. And so that's where, you know, we get into the realm of uh, everything's quantified. And so when we get men get sick of things, they want to go beyond it. You know, that's where we're at transhumanism and, and yeah. uh, you know, tech, techne, techne, you know, dominating everything. Well, I guess you could say, including economics, by the way, including yeah. economics. Uh, theoretically, free trade is the idea of removing borders and expanding the division of labor, people trading freely amongst each other, communicating. It uh, tends to support peace in theory, but in reality, you have a, a, a super class of psychopaths manipulating the exactly. process. Exactly. Yes. I don't know why libertarians can't figure that out. And that out. gets into the stupid libertarianism yes. argument. Yes. Um, I, good, good, here's another, I made a, uh, an, an example of free trade um, being utilized throughout history to create a super state. Uh, the United States of America, uh, the uh, whole idea of the federal union, much of the impetus for the federal union and the, and the creation of the constitution, the ratification of the constitution was creation of a global free of a continental free trade zone oh good argument good point yeah but it was ine inevitably used to create the what we can call it as empire of liberty which is a contradiction of term <laughs> so, right the war against the states lincoln used although lincoln would use the whole idea because the whole war was over the maintenance of a, of a federal tariff yes okay to supply various boondoggles and and when the and I, yeah i always point this out from i mean i'm from the south so i'm, I'm probably going to be biased but uh you know, when, when the slaves are freed, uh, it's not like they frolicked about and created a little, you know, utopia of whatever. <laughs> they had to uh, I, they I, had to go work as wage slaves in the factories <laughs> in the north. They were shipped north. Yeah, the so they're working to, to disrupt the cities. They're working in many yeah. times uh, worse conditions in these uh, northern factories. And and I think as uh, you commented, you wrote a piece that quite created quite a stir uh, about, um, uh, what was it, about... Uh, Martin Luther King, but it was about... Yeah, Martin Luther King, how, how the civil rights movement was, was co-opted from the beginning by yeah. other interests. Well, I was, right, I was arguing yeah. that, that um, going back to that piece, but 
this is another example of that use of language. A lot of people messaged me and said, did you mean to say the rise of the demonic free cult? No, I meant demonic because that's the Greek. Demonic, yeah, people, yeah. Yeah, that's the Greek for the for the, the common, the vulgar. Yeah. Demonic entertainment, etc. And the point of that was to show that freedom, liberty, these are in many ways brands or slogans or ideals of uh, what we said before, ideological technology. And so they're mm -hmm. very useful. And now that doesn't mean that I'm saying that there's no such thing as freedom. I think that there is. But what I'm saying is that you always have to be you know, on the lookout, be aware of how the system is able to, through language, through legal uh, jurisprudence and wrangling and, and the whole legal structure of everything, right? I mean, that's how the T, TTP and all that stuff's being passed is under all this, all these laws of, you know, mountains of legalities and legalese that nobody can sift through or figure out. That's a manifestation of this ability to kind of like a, a magician, you know, kind of bait and switch with words and terms. <laughs> this is another con man game of ad hoc, you know, creation of meanings and denying of meanings and, you know, sort of the Spanish Inquisition of uh, Monty Python where you're like, you don't even know what you're guilty of, but you're guilty. But um, yeah, so I was arguing that somebody brought up Martin Luther King and I said, well, he's just another manifestation of that because I see... What I read, I've read a few of his sermons. On, I'm not, he's not a person I'm particularly that interested in. But what, from what I've read, it's pretty clearly liberation theology. Uh, and liberation theology is Marxism. It's it's a tool of the same global structure. That's, uh, you know, it's just one arm of the global structure. Um, you know, used in uh, um, poor countries to basically uh, oust the former order. Um, and that doesn't mean that the former order was good. It's just it's just a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I see uh, King as as a as a person to be an icon or an image of uh, freedom. Uh, he may have been uh, completely sincere, uh, believed you know everything that he thought was good. Uh, JFK may have been the same way, uh, or at least in part. Uh, but regardless. That's the unfortunate nature of the system is that uh, even sincere persons can be can be utilized, and I think mm -hmm. uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the libertarian types are that way as well. Well, that would be the free trade argument. Uh, another example: some people have, have mentioned about the breakup of the union in 1861, where uh, I, I have argued that uh, on the basis of the original understanding of the Constitution and based on natural rights, the sovereign states did have the right to secede from the union. Oh, I think written. I don't know how anybody doesn't it's history. admit that. It's like, yeah, and and so I mean they they had delegated certain powers to mm -hmm. the federal government. This the fact that it's delegated means you have the right to take this. Means that secession back. is real. Yeah, secession is real, and secession was implied in the, in the ratification of the Constitution. Exactly, the states <laughs> made it specific, and that those that that applied to all states. So right. legally, they had, you know uh, they had more of a right to secede in 1861 than it did in 1776. Uh, legally speaking, mm -hmm. but there are people who argue that the cause of success of uh, the crisis was brought about by uh, external interests, the European bankers. Mm -hmm. So there's an example of a righteous cause being manipulated to achieve an end. There you go. Yeah, uh, and it took it took the North to invade. If Lincoln hadn't played, you know, played right. along, and and uh, the British for a time uh, supported the South. Yeah. All right. So that doesn't mean that like the British were good and the South was good. It meant that the British were interested in uh, cotton uh, profits. Well the, well, the British have always been concerned with the rights of small nations, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, people forget that they're, they're the ones that burned the White House. Mm -hmm. We went to war twice for the British Empire in the 20th century. Yeah, they're they're humanitarian <laughs> humanitarian for sure. Yeah, but that's an example of of uh, of a cause. Uh, you know the cause you know of secession uh being a righteous cause uh but being manipulated to achieve an end yeah it's a great example yeah um that that, that involves uh, uh uh belmont and the rothschilds manifest destiny all that was apparently um, mm -hmm. spread about by rothschild interest in the bank i think the idea was to create a war this is the theory i'm not saying this is the truth but it, it, it has some validity i think that to start a war, that Lincoln would have to finance by borrowing money, and Lincoln didn't. He issued the greenbacks, mm -hmm. which factored 
they perhaps factored into his assassination. Of course, by that time, Lincoln had many people who wanted to kill him, so it might have been something else. But it is, you know, talk about John Wilkes Booth, his connection to um, masonry and all Knights, that. Knights of the Golden Circle. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and his, that ring up in Canada and all that. So it was a why. And that, that was a conspiracy. So Yes, absolutely. <laughs> You know, yeah, and that's that, what I, that's what, that was yeah. another point I was trying to argue that uh, just because you get off doesn't mean that you're a martyr. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you still be a tool. I mean, uh, thugs yeah. murder other thugs all the time. So yeah, so that doesn't. You know. So, uh, but um, so now we're dealing with stupid libertarians. We're getting running out of time here. So you, you made a comment: stupid libertarians not being able to cope with the idea of uh, deep state, uh, power politics, corruption. Uh, uh, want to go into that a little bit? Their inability to deal with the, the reality of well, the... yeah. Uh, okay. Again, I, I would. I mean, if we look at the history of liberty movements as a whole, I mean, we can really just see this as something that. I mean, again, it really just depends on how far back you want to go. Um, but I think you know the French Revolution is a pretty obvious one for modernity as marking a, a, a you know a specific point where we can say that uh, you know. Sp- power interests were definitely involved in this so-called revolution, uh, which was really, you know, intimately tied into uh, masonry. This is where we get the rise of Grand Orient masonry. Um, and some people have made some interesting arguments uh, that uh, Britain may have been involved in French Revolution from the background, or at least bankers. Uh, there's probably something to that. Um, but from the perspective of just the movement or the revolutions themselves it's interesting that what happens is you have the commune and the excuse me you have the uh, committee for public safety and Robespierre and all that and then you have the commune and you have um, the second attempt at establishing uh, the revolution after that fails and then that fails and then we have Napoleon so we have this imperialism that arises out of the syndicalism (laughs) so to me that's uh, illustrative because really that's where it always goes you know that this is um, as has been pointed out by many people many times and as plato pointed out you know the the democracy uh ends in the oligarchy it ends in the in the tyranny and the dictatorship and there's a reason for that because it's a just a pendulum swing of the dialectic and ultimately the democracy was uh, always controlled from behind the scenes by those who were clever manipulators of uh, the human mind so, you know, think about Bernays statement in the propaganda. He says, you know, we are controlled by men behind the scenes whom we never see and probably will never see. And, and that's really the, the secret of democracy all along. So democracy is, is a, a trick. It's a tool, a technique for destabilization. And it always has been, you know, we think about destabilization in geopolitics, referring to things like uh, Ukraine or, um, you know, rose revolutions, orange revolutions, and all that, which it is, uh, but that's not a new idea, right? It's, this is an old idea. And uh, if I recall, even in uh, Caesar's works, he talks about this. He talks about how you can, you know, create dissension within the enemy camp, uh, spread lies and rumors and so forth uh, with the barbarians, is what he did with these different tribes. Machiavelli discusses it in our war. Um, so, you know, again, the old idea is nothing, nothing new here, nothing new to see. And, but so when we come to the idea of liberty, uh, I make the argument that liberty doesn't exist without a context. There's no such thing as like generic liberty. There's just this idea that like floats out there and then you read a bunch of books and you get to a certain point, you, then you're there. Liberty as a philosophical concept always requires some other context, right? So, for example, if I don't, this is what I argued in my demotic cult piece, if, if I don't have a conception of personhood, which is a philosophical notion, then liberty doesn't even make sense, right? So liberty presupposes that you have actors, persons with wills and faculties and um, some sort of sense of rights, right? And so this is why libertarian history, libertarian movements have uh, operated on the basis of natural right philosophy, which I don't think ultimately works because it's not, um, when you have concomitant with that, the presupposition of empiricism, which most do, uh, or Aristotelianism, say with Ayn Rand or something like that, uh, what happens is the idea of the natural right (laughs) is, 
I mean, why do I not have the natural right to take away your natural rights, right? So the libertarians always talk about this uh, negative position of the state and the nonviolence principle and all this stuff. There's no reason why there's a nonviolence principle, right? And it's always a reification of the thing that they just said, right? So you're not supposed to bring harm to another person. Well, that's basically just utilitarianism, and utilitarianism has all kinds of flaws at a fundamental level that show that it's completely unworkable. One of my favorites, of course, is the example of the person who, this is a, a classic problem for utilitarianism. There's nothing in utilitarianism uh, about the general good or the not harming of other people, however you want to phrase it. There's nothing in that that tells you which kind of harm you have to avoid and not avoid, right? So uh, if I buy, if I buy the stream that my village um, gets its water from and I uh, don't let anyone have that water or I pollute it, that's my uh, right because I own that stream, right? And there's nothing that, that now, th that may not be an overt assault or attack harming a person. It may be a covert attack harming a person, but there's nothing within the schema or the system of libertarian philosophy or thought that can actually explain why that is objectively metaphysically wrong. And so we even have those statements from, say, Friedman that says you can't make a argument that someone has to take care of a baby. They will, he thinks, but you can't argue that they have to or that, that there's any necessity placed upon that action. So we're basically just back at you can't get, uh, you know, is from an ought. So I would, I would just say David Hume is, is good enough. <laughs> if I adopt those principles to critique it as uh, unworkable. The other example I wanted to give for utilitarianism is that um, there's, there's, uh, there's nothing that gives you any benchmark to decide whether quantitative um, pleasure or qualitative pleasure is to be preferred in a situation where we're concerned about the good of others, right? So we might have a situation where um, if a village uh, was experiencing a rash of murders and the uh, law enforcement of whatever kind, even if it's a private security firm, not a state law enforcement, if the private security firm decided that it was in the best interest based on the social contract of, all, uh, of everyone around them to uh, find a patsy to assuage everyone's fears then there's nothing in libertarianism that shows that there's anything wrong with doing that. You say, well, but that's, uh, but that's hurting another person, right? That's killing another person. That, that would be a, a violation of the principle. They said, well, what, but, but wait a minute. It's not, it may be hurting one person, but the qualitative, quantitative level of good that we can accomplish through this act outweighs the bad in the moral calculus here. So... Uh, again, I realize that not every libertarian would necessarily affirm classic utilitarianism in Bentham or something like that. But what I'm saying is that we have, that we have the same ideas at work here, the same philosophical problems. And they all start from the idea of uh, the individual sort of being the atomistic uh, unit that uh, is the sort of the benchmark arbiter of what is and is not true, what uh, is good and evil. And that's the problem with all of those kinds of systems that start with the assumption of the primacy of the particular uh, against mm -hmm. the one. Now, what you say, now, I know someone might say, well, my idea of libertarianism would be, uh, it, it's not so much a philosophy of life, it just a, it spells out my relationship to the state. And um, there's so much more to civilization, so much more to the community than, than politics. Mm -hmm. And we have civil society, we have mutual aid societies, benevolent associations, family, churches, and these things comprise uh, the real meat of mm -hmm. society. Uh, the, you know, and that's um, and uh, this is what you know. It's the it's the commerce, the free commerce, the goodwill among people trading amongst each other um, that make life pleasant and they create all the good things in life. And I guess, I guess the difference between the Watchman State versus the you know, anarchy, um, uh, they would say that well, I'm a libertarian. I'm a libertarian to the extent that I uh, 
this is how I think I should relate to the state, mm -hmm. whether the state should exist or not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that I, uh, um, I apply libertarianism, political thought, to my idea of God or my religion. Sure. Her, yeah, you know, yeah. so there's much more to life than politics. And I, I see it as a way to kind of to cordon off or to marginalize politics as much as possible because mm -hmm. politics is theft and violence. Right. I'm gonna I'm, I'm I'm gonna have to go soon, but oh, sure. yes. But uh, maybe next time we can we can delve more yeah. into that very topic because I, I would like to speak to that. But just quickly yeah. in response, what I would say is that um, I think there's it's difficult to construct a position where you want to make a moral objective social claims mm -hmm. that is only restricted to one sphere um and i i would make an argument to that case but it would be sort of a, a protracted argument that would yeah, take, sure. take a well, little Jake, while but yeah i've kept you longer than it's I okay it's so. okay <laughs> i'll let you go to uh let's enjoy the rest of your evening okay well yeah you will get back you know maybe we'll talk a little later on that and some other topics because your, your your website pr provides a uh, it's a wealth of material, so. No. Well, I might try to. That's a good question you've asked, and so I, I might try to flesh out some ideas on that in the article this week or something. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, it's one of the yeah, yeah it's something where a lot of people think that uh, libertarians they're make they're creating a philosophy of life, and I've heard some say this. No, this is just how I think this should involve. This is how I think the state should operate. And right. There's so much more to life than that. So. Right. Okay. Well, we covered a lot tonight. Um, thanks a lot for coming. All right. And uh, good night. And. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. Bye. Good night.